Heavenly Father, we come before you today on this beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous spring day, at least where I am. And we thank you, Father, for the reminders through nature of beauty and of you and of creation and of hope and of renewal. We've just passed through a religious season of uh, focusing on the resurrection, and that gives us the greatest hope of all, but it should carry forward. We ask that you be with us today as we've gathered, as we're going to discuss what we learned this week, and uh, hope to come to a better understanding of it, to come have it clearer in our minds and so well planted within us that you would cause it to come to our remembrance in times of need. So help us, Father, guide us in our discussion to keep us from error, keep us from straying off from truth, not making it more than what it is, and certainly not making it less than what it is, but to be exactly on point and centered on your balance and your word. Um, we ask you for that in a mighty way, to Father, because it definitely takes you for that to, to occur. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. Amen. All right. So this week, I think every week is important. And this week is definitely important, an important subject. But as we get started, because we're looking at James chapter four, we want to go back and see what are some of the themes we've seen in James so far to get us to this place in James four. Uh, what was in chapter one? What are some of the main themes that we saw? Issues, uh, points, whatever you want to call them. trials. Yes. So trials that are going to come, trials they were enduring, trials that we might endure as well, and the reason, basically, for those trials in our lives. Because when we're going through the trials, sometimes that's the very question we ask. Why? You know, why, why am I going through this? Um, which I always tell myself that's like the wrong question, but it isn't the wrong question. But it's more because usually I'm saying, why me? you know, why am I going through this? And what we really need to be focusing on is what is it that you're trying to change in me? What is it that I can learn from this? Um, so definitely trials and endurance that's produced and the faith required, but also the, the perfecting of us, the completing of us, not that we're going to be ever without error or with or perfect in the sense that we never do anything wrong, but that we are maturing that we're becoming more and more like Jesus. Um, and we um, that theme carries forward even in other paragraphs of chapter one, where it talks about the perseverance under trials. So we've got that endurance. And then we have some kind of introductions of various themes in chapter one that are really fleshed out more as he, so it's not like in chapter four, we see something for the first time, usually. Usually we can carry backwards and see it in one or a previous chapter where something is mentioned, like tongue. Uh, the tongue is mentioned in chapter one as another um, being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. That's another theme in chapter one. Um, bridling the tongue is where it's talking about. So what else? Um, what are some other themes that we saw and some of these are big chunky ones, like you can just say this, you know, like Millie was saying, um, trials. That that's if you just say that, there's so much that can be said about that one. So in chapter two, what are some of the things that we saw there? I like favoritism. Right. Um, not showing favoritism for because what is the basis for which or the why we are not to show favoritism kind of what's the bottom line love love yes um and where does that come from who does that come from from god Yes. So God himself. God doesn't show favoritism. There you go. God himself does not show favoritism, thankfully, right? Because we're mm -hmm. part of that. <laughs> we're the recipients of that. So we're glad for that. But 
as he is our example, as he is our, our solid foundation, we too are not to show favoritism. Um, that is the basis, the main basis. And it is from that royal law and the law of love, um, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And honestly, if we would remember that, I mean, this is something we teach children. Seriously, it is that number one, it's that basic and that understandable, but it also, if it's come out of our mouths to our children, hopefully it hits our ears too, right? This is not just a children thing. This is ourselves. And really children can be exemplifying the, the most extreme versions of selfishness, like watch toddlers play, <laughs> um, it's mine. You know, that's one of the first words that will come out of their mouth and often, and it's usually in a wine. Mine. Um, they don't share. Well, they um, plow through, like they're so focused on whatever it is they're going for. They'll just run right over somebody, not intending to hurt or plow over them. They're just focused. Like it's just me, 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 me. So they're a, a perfect illustration of the extremes. And we as adults have hopefully learned Therefore, our behavior follows. But in essence, a lot of times we just learn to mask it better or justify it with words, or especially to ourselves. Um, but really, in our nature, we have this, we are the same. We're the same. We're that toddler that's saying, mine, you know. So yes, we um we need to teach this to children. Absolutely. We need to remind ourselves of it as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. We dearly love ourselves. We truly do. Now, there's going to be people out there that are immediately, I guess, because it, it came to my mind too, are going to say, you know, there's depression, there's uh, low self-esteem and all of that. And I'm going to posit, I'm going to say possibly low self-esteem, shyness, all these things, a lot of times are actually the opposite of what they present. Like a an extremely shy person sometimes is really wanting more attention in the sense of, you know, they they are like they don't want to engage, but it's really because they have a very strong self-focus. Shyness is an extremely kind of selfish viewpoint at times. And yeah, it would take work because there are some people that just innately are more introverted. Um, but really a lot of, if you, if you look at the different personalities and I mean, all of them, I'm not trying to focus on some as worse than others, but if you look at all the personalities, there is a definite um, negative immature connotation to any of them. And it really comes down to self-focus, but that goes back to, we see, we dearly love ourselves. So we like to feed our flesh. We like to feed our, our appetites. We like to give ourselves what ourselves want. Um, and therefore, if we love ourselves that much and give ourselves whatever, we should love others the same is what it's saying. Love really? others as you love yourself. You dearly love your others. Dearly wish to provide. Dearly wish to feed their, not necessarily feed their desires because that could be bad for them. But think about how you would provide for yourself provide for others the same way and also know what did God do he loved us enough to send his son to die for us there is no limit to God's selflessness that's our example okay what else did we learn in two the biggie faith without works is dead I'm glad you said it was a biggie because I think it's a biggie too <laughs> it's and and honestly um it's also part of the main theme, which is be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. It's just, it's another way of looking at it, another way of saying it. Um, and really, I feel like as we develop all the rest of the themes, it's kind of going to come back. Like it went forward to this point of chapter two, and it's kind of going to go back to that point of chapter two. It comes down to kind of one of, it, we've talked about it being controversial, but I'm going to stop calling it controversial. And let's just talk about how difficult sometimes this concept is in our Christian life to have in balance in our minds, not just in our practices, because 
for me. Uh, I usually just talk about me because that's the only mind I, I have can tap into and it's convoluted. But as we look at this, I, I, I can tend towards legalism. And when I say legalism, I'm not just talking about me having a list of rules for me. Usually the bad form of legalism is my rules are now are supposed to be applied to everybody else. I use the word should a lot, lots. I use it for myself a lot. I should do this. I shouldn't do that. I should, should, should. But I have a tendency to then want to project that onto others. Okay. And where's the balance is it's got to come from God's word. If, if there is a should, and obviously we've got the 10 commandments, <laughs> um, but we've got the Pentateuch, the fi first five books are full of rules. Um, Jesus said that we are to keep his commandments, which by the way, means he has some, and that's not usually how he's portrayed. He's not portrayed as a giver of commands, a rules. You got to follow and do what I say. That's not how Jesus is usually portrayed, but he says, we're going to show him love by keeping his commandments. So we got to know he has them and we got to know what they are. Um, and when you listen to his teachings, yes, it is a lot about love, thankfully, isn't it wonderful? But within it, it's always a higher standard than anything you read in the Old Testament. He takes anything of the Old Testament and amps it up. You know that from the Sermon on the Mount. If a man commits adultery, that's an act. We know what that is, very clear. But if a man thinks on a woman, and that means an ongoing thinking, not a thought that, you know, because we got to capture thoughts, but, you know, an ongoing, he doesn't stop it, dwells on it, thinking on a woman in that way, then he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's more critical, what he does in his heart. So Jesus amps everything up. Um, he does have commands. That's another thing. Okay, so this part is critical. Faith without works is dead. What do works, where do they fit? It's not a works to salvation. It's not a works to keep salvation. And that's the part sometimes I struggle with. And I struggle with portraying that. Like I might say things and I have to stop and go, wait a minute, am I starting to say it's works, it's salvation plus? Because there's no salvation plus, none, it's salvation. So what work, where do works fit in? Works are an outflowing and kind of a proof of your salvation. They aren't a keeping of your salvation. Works don't keep you. Works didn't get you there. But works are, are a necessary proof. So, <laughs> that's the reason I say it's not necessarily just controversial. It's that uh, greased pig issue. Um, I say this a lot. Those that have followed me for a while or been in my studies for a while know I use this analogy. If you haven't heard it before, I'll explain it quickly. If you've ever heard about or been to a fair where there's a greased pig and people, the kids usually are running after and trying to capture the greased pig, you can see the pig. You can smell the pig. You can touch the pig. You can even get your arms around the pig, but because it's greased, it you can have a complete hold on it and it can squirt right back out. So that's where a lot of issues in Christianity fall for me is I have a firm grip on them and then they can seemingly slip out again. And I think that's just part of the faith walk, just going back and going back. Because if we got things and we put them in our pockets and we're done, how often are we going to revisit that issue? You know, so that's the reason I call them grease pick issues. Um, there's handle, but difficulty as well. Okay. So now in chapter three, what were the two main discussions in chapter three? What did we talk about? Taming the tongue and two kinds of wisdom. Yes. The tongue and wisdom, taming the tongue in particular, uh, the fact that it's difficult, if not impossible to tame the tongue, but we're supposed to try. We're supposed to do it. Uh, as a maturing person, we're supposed to keep our bridle, our tongues. And then the wisdoms, 
are one was called the wisdom not from above and the other one was called the wisdom from above. Okay, so we have trials, endurance, proving, you know, uh, enduring helps to perfect our faith. And then we've got the idea of the perfect pure religion, undefiled religion, proving ourselves to be doers of the word, not hearers only, not showing favoritism as God didn't and through the royal law of love. We have faith without works is dead. Um, our, we're justified by faith and by works, not stumbling in what we're saying, bridling the tongue, mm -hmm. keeping that under control and wisdom. Mm -hmm from above versus wisdom, not from above. And then we roll into four. We are not stopping. We're rolling right into it, right? We always want to see what the connections are. So we've, we've talked about James overall. James is writing to Jewish believers that are scattered. We believe by the diaspora and maybe other means, but certainly by that. These are believers, or he's writing to a group that it seems to be believers or and they're scattered. These letters, his letter probably would have been reproduced and de decimated, de you know, sent out to other groups. So many, many, many. It's same thing with Peter's letter, same thing with Paul's letter, same thing with Jude's letter. All of these letters were maybe written and sent to one place, but then they would have been um, uh, all copied and sent, or maybe he sent numerous copies. Okay, so um, as you go into chapter four, we start with what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among us? There's actually those two questions. So that's the first one. First question is, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts? Carnal desires. Yes. Hang on, let me get the words up here. Among you. Okay, that's the first question. This, just write down the second question, then we'll start answering it. Um, is not the source of your pleasures. That wage war in your members. Is not the source. Is not the source. I, I put a of in there, but that's not supposed to be there. Is not the source, because I was thinking that I didn't read right. Is not the source your pleasure? So he asked the question and he kind of asked another question, which is actually the answer, right? This is a, a pattern that Paul would do. He would ask a question and it usually came from the preceding whatever he said. There'd be kind of like a natural progression of thought like, oh, well, the question you would have based on what I just said is this. So he would ask the question, this is James doing it and then go on to answer the question. Okay, so the initial answer is what you were saying is the your pleasures that wage war. It's your fleshly actions or fleshly desires. Okay, so in verses two and three, he answers the question more. What does he say there? Why do they not have, <clears throat> why don't they have and you can dot 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 that why don't they have whatever they want what is the answer is it because you don't ask or they didn't ask okay um <clears throat> part of it is they don't ask <clears throat> And then part of it is because they do ask, right? They do ask, but what? The lust. Yes, it has to do with lust. Um, it has to do with wrong um, motives. Yeah. Right? Wrong motives. Um, okay, so 
what else in verse two he says he did give some like you do this and this is what happens you, you right it says you lust but you don't have and then what leads anger and anger leads to hatred yes And as Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, you've murdered them, right? Mm -hmm. right? So he says you lust and you don't have. And then as a result of not having, you commit murder. And then it says you're envious. And again, it says you cannot obtain, but I'm going to say again, don't have. You can't obtain. Another reason you don't have. Um, and... Um, so you fight and quarrel. Okay. So these are kind of progressions each time. They lust, they don't have, so therefore they commit murder. They're envious and they cannot obtain. Same thing as don't have. And they fight and quarrel. Mm -hmm. you, you do not have because you don't ask. And this is all under why don't they have. And you ask and don't receive, same thing as don't have. You ask, you don't receive, which it just said you don't ask, but you, you do ask, but you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. And then <clears throat> so that it may be sp spent on pleasures. On pleasures. Okay. So... Um, we're going to get to four because that's very important, but I wanted to establish this for a second because it sounds like he's all over the place, like um, in, in a good way, like he's covering everything. It's like you've got this group over here that's asking, but they're not getting. Why aren't they getting? Because they're asking with the wrong motives. You have another group that is asking, but they don't have. And um, I'm sorry, they that was the one. The others just aren't asking. Okay, if you're not asking God for whatever it is that you don't have, what is the source of you not asking? It doesn't say it here. I want you to think, what is the reason you don't ask God for something? And let's say it's not something that is a wrong motive to be spent on your pleasures. It is something that would all, God and everybody would agree, would be the right motive. Why don't you have? Why would you not ask for that? Because, you don't because that. it's... I heard they're not, they are not relying on God's will. There you go. Not relying. So one of the reasons, and we're we're going to extrapolate here. Um, what's another way for saying not relying? You're not trusting, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It's a trust issue. Somebody else said something and I didn't hear it, but I heard you talking. What was it? You don't want that answer. That you know God's going to give you. That's a good one. <laughs> the answer to the word. Okay. <laughs> You, a selfish prayer, you can put in. Well, I, I, I say it's because they really don't believe. Okay. it's a And that kind of goes back to trust, but the belief and trust are a little bit different, but I agree. <laughs> it's a lack of faith. It's a faith issue, right? Okay. So these are reasons. <clears throat> um, Leslie's, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Leslie, what you're saying is that let's say what I'm asking for is something I'm really dreading. <laughs> like it, I know I need it, right? I know I need patience, for instance. And there's a joke out there that I don't love, but I actually understand the reason behind it. It's like, don't ask for patience because if you turn back to chapter one, how do you get patience? Through trials, through persevering through trials, right? It doesn't literally say patience all the time there, but endurance and perseverance, that's all tied into patience. So how do you get patience? How do we mature? We mature through bad things, right? We'd like to say, God, I just, I really want all the information I can have about you, all the knowledge I can have about you so that I can live my life however I want. So I am literally just gonna have my nose in this book all the time and that's all I need is your word. And that'd be it. Be great, wouldn't it? 
I just have to, I love to read. <laughs> I could just like turn off the world to, and, and read and that's it. But generally speaking, as human beings, the way we learn is through bad things happening. Through, um, uh, again, I, sometimes those these illustrations and I'm borrowing, I don't know who, from who, but you've got that picture of that guy that supposedly hears from God and God says, go push this boulder up the hill. So you've got this picture of this man, the boulder's like 10 times bigger than him and he's struggling and he's pushing every day. He goes out, he pushes on that boulder and he pushes, he doesn't budget even once, not even a little bit. It doesn't move and years pass. And at a point, this guy's obviously very patient and very obedient, but at a point he looks at God and he says, this has done no good. And God says, I didn't ask you to do it to move the rock. Look at how much stronger you are, like how much you've built up. If you, if I go down, we have a workout room in our basement. If I go down and I work out on the weights, I don't move that machine at all. <laughs> the weights I can move the, you know, with the resistance training, I don't move that, that thing at all, but I can build my muscles as a result of working out. And that's the picture of that illustration of the man moving the boulder. The point wasn't to move the boulder. The point was to build up the man. The point of trials isn't to accomplish something ourselves in that trial. Like, I don't know, whatever. You know, I, I can name some of them in my life. Um, it is whatever God is trying to build up in me. That's the point of the trial is the perfecting of my faith, not the changing the person that I want to change the other person, because <laughs> that's usually what we're going to counseling for, right? Is to change someone else. A good counselor is like, I'm not dealing with that person. I'm dealing with a person sitting here in front of me. The best, the only thing we can do. Okay. So um, when he goes through all of this, the reason we don't ask in those circumstances, and I think that's what Leslie was saying, all of them are good. Like we're not trusting, we're not relying is what um, I think we said was we're not relying. And that's the idea of trust. Sandy was saying, we don't really believe. So it's a matter of our faith, right? And we're not asking maybe because we really don't want what it is we know would be coming, Um I do caution sometimes and say there have been times when I've asked God to do whatever it takes in a certain situation. And I may be praying for someone else. Like I may be praying that that God gets that person's attention for salvation or to bring them back, you know, whichever. And I have said the words, whatever it takes. And then not immediately, but some point after that, he does something to me. And I've kind of sat back because I see the connection and I say, you know what, God, I said, whatever it takes. I just didn't realize it was going to happen to me. So are you willing? Like if you were literally giving the options right in front of you and God directly was speaking to you and you absolutely knew and that you had a choice. You know, I'm not going to go through a hard time, but that person is not going to hear the gospel and not get saved. Or I'm going to go through something really, really difficult. And that person, and er, there's going to be more, but you know, if it was a direct connection, that person's going to hear the gospel and that person gets saved. Which would you choose? Be honest. I mean, you don't have to answer. This is more rhetorical. Which would you, like, would you, let's say it's your child. Would you go through a really difficult time for your child to be saved? I would. A thousand times over, I would. How about some of you don't like? I would. I would, if, especially if I knew the direct connection. We don't know the direct connection, but ask. Ask for the things that we know, like wisdom. We know God will give us wisdom if we ask for it. 
And we don't know that we're going to get the thing we ask for. But also check your motives. Check your motives. And here's the thing. Our hearts are desperately wicked. Who can know them? Answer, not me. Who can, who can know my heart? God. There you go. He can know my heart. So if I'm going to ask, I can ask him to reveal my heart to me. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because I have to go in knowing I can, I can be self-deceived. I can be fooled by myself. Um, hopefully the more I'm, I'm, I mature, the less that's going to happen at the same time. If I'm asking, um, you, if I am asking, I need to ask and say, Lord, am I asking for the right reasons or am I asking? Because, I, okay, I'll give me as an example again. Some of you know, I have a, a son who will not speak to us, has cut us out of his life. I had in-laws that caused us a lot of problems. And now I have siblings and my own mom that's causing me, like cut me out of her life. I mean, it's everywhere, everywhere I turn had friends that stabbed us in the back, I, you know, churches that have just ripped us apart and, and gone after our children. And, and then this is over a long period of time. Thankfully, it's not, well, it's kind of piled up, but there's uh, many times I have prayed in those situations and God has shown me my prayer is to relieve myself, mm. right? I pray for that situation to be resolved. I don't think that's a bad thing. But I'm really praying because I want the hurt to stop. Mm. And I and God has shown me, no, pray for their salvation. Pray and, and my own part in it, but pray for their salvation. Pray because I don't know if they're saved or not. They're certainly not acting it. You know, th that's all I can know. God can know their heart. I can't. But then I have to watch, am I praying for their salvation so my situation is relieved. <laughs> so I have to constantly check my heart. You know, it is it is a selfish thing sometimes to pray for somebody's salvation. That is the weirdest statement I can make, but it really is true. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to treat me better. Right? Yeah. Or, I, or my status is going to be restored. You know, I'm, I'm going to get my position back. I'm going to get my good name back. And I have to watch that motive. Okay. But there's also what, there's, there's another extreme of your wrong motives for pleasures. And that is praying for stuff. You know, praying for more, more money, not so that we can just provide for our needs or provide for other needs, but because we want the bigger house, the bigger home, the bigger car, the nicer car, the if we're praying for those things and those are the motives, which is for our pleasures, then we, we are not going to receive. Because yeah, it's funny you say that because this week I had gone into an argument with someone. So then I remembered, I think I had this, the, the uh, scripture sitting in front of me. So then I'm like, okay, and I was in a bad mood. I said, okay, so what's the source of this quarrel? You know, what's, what's the comment? And I started kind of answering the questions and it, it basically was, well, I want to be relieved of this stress. I want this to go smoother for me ended up being at the bottom of it. So it's true. Once you start really looking at why you want a certain thing or why you're angry, why I've always found God always turns it back to me. Always right. Turns it back. And I, and I think that is what, um, what is what we've got to do is is just ask God, search my heart, you know, know my wicked ways, know my wicked thoughts, reveal them to me, and then lead me on the path of righteousness. The very thing we're praying for may still should be prayed for. Like it would never be wrong for me to pray for somebody's salvation. But sometimes I'm praying for somebody's salvation to tell on them to God. Like they've hurt my feelings. They well more than hurt my feelings. They they've really just absolutely absolutely devastated me, ripped me apart. Therefore, I'm pointing at them and I'm saying that person is not saved. 
telling on myself a lot here. Um, and I, I just, I have to stop and go, Lord, I don't know. You do. If that person needs to be saved, obviously I want them to be saved because that's the ultimate absolute thing that is the most important. But if they are saved and I, and they've just hurt me, you know, I can get over it if it is something I can get over. Um, you know, so I have to, God just has to work through that with me a lot, like, like Millie, like you're saying, and that doesn't mean you don't ask. That doesn't mean you don't pray. It's just let God help you get down to your motives. And, and that's where not my will, but yours be done shouldn't just be a tack on line at the end, like sincerely yours. It should literally be our prayer. Because think about Jesus in the garden when he was praying that and saying, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. If God had just given Jesus what he asked for, we wouldn't be talking about salvation because there wouldn't be salvation. In the moment, Jesus was showing his humanity and his sovereignty at the same time because he knew what was coming. He absolutely knew. And he was basically in that moment saying, if there is another way. So it also kind of gives us permission in a way to say the same thing. If there's another way, God, please, I don't want to have to go through this. But if not, if this is the way for whatever it is, you know, whatever the end point is, not my will, but yours be done. Pray like Jesus prays. It's okay to be human. God knows it anyway. The main thing is, no matter what I say or what I think, God knows my heart and I don't sometimes. He can reveal it. So as we're going through and looking at this, the point is, as we look at the first of this, what are the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Go back to the wisdom that we just, well, the tongue for sure, the works for sure, all of this practical faith we're working out through the book of James, it's all tied. It's all tied. This is all about works. It's not just about hearing, it's about doing. But what the wisdom from above, if you go back and look at it, or actually let's look at the wisdom not from above, and it says um, in verse 14 of, of three, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, and, and it says, uh, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. That's where our, we can lie to ourselves. But that the wisdom that is not that which comes down from above is earthly, natural, and demonic. Okay, so this is the... I'm just going to say earthly wisdom. And that's the one that is not from above. It's got jealousy, selfish, ambition. What else did we see? Um, it's arrogant, which is tied into lying to self. Um, lying against the truth, but lying to lying against, I almost say truth under here too, lying against the truth. Um, I'm trying to make sure I get all the words. Um, natural, demonic. These are all words that are, okay. And then it says in verse 16, where jealousy and selfish ambition uh, exist, it results in disorder and every evil thing. So all of this results in disorder and every evil thing. Now we looked at that last week, but I want to tie it in because he's just told us where this wisdom comes from, what it leads to disorder and every evil thing and gives the, the, the specifics of it. Demonic is 
a really strong word, meaning not from God at all, <laughs> quite the opposite, but natural and earthly are very similar. Earthly means anything of this world and natural is flesh. It's, it's what we live out in our non-spiritual way. So sometimes you just have to see the opposite. Natural means it's not under the control of this Holy Spirit. So it's not spiritual. It's natural. It's demonic. It's not of God at all. But it's there's jealousy. There's selfish ambition. It's arrogant, lying against the truth, lying to yourself. And it causes disorder and evil. Then we roll into four and it says, what's the source of quarrels and conflicts from you? Which wisdom are quarrels and conflicts from? Is it wisdom from above? Yeah, godly wisdom. It's not from godly wisdom. It's from the other, <laughs> right? It's earthly, from, earthly wisdom. Yeah, it's from the earthly wisdom. It's from the opposite. Yeah. So that's that's one of the tie-ins. It's one of the flows of thought. He's just told you there's two different kinds of wisdom. Okay. So which wisdom, as a child of God, are we to be tapping into? Godly wisdom. Yeah. Spirit-led, spirit-led life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Spirit-led life, the godly wisdom, wisdom from above, which is pure and peaceable and gentle and reasonable and full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy linked back to that favoritism thing. I mean, there would obviously be, there's more to hypocrisy, but it obviously that who's and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And then he says, what are the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? It's the exact opposite of not just the wisdom from above, which is extremely important, but it's the one we're supposed to be tapping into, the one we're supposed to be walking out. Like you said, the spirit guided life, right? That's what this practical faith that James is talking about is all about. And he's dealing with people. He's dealing with humans. We're in that category. Um, even if we're not Jewish, we're he's writing to us. It's very practical. And so then he says, like it goes all the way around. You can imagine that they're asking, like, you know, we're praying, why aren't we getting? You know, and he's saying, Well, you're either praying with the wrong motives or you're not actually asking. And if you're um in, in when you look at verse two, where it says you lust and you don't have, so you commit murder, you're envious, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel, you don't have because you don't ask. But those first parts are their efforts to get what they want, as opposed to how are we supposed to do it, which is asking with the right motives to the source that we can trust to the one that's going to give us maybe not what we want, but what we need and in faith, because we believe not just in him, not just about him, but we believe we can trust him. We believe he will give us what we need. The big difference here, pleasures, wants, envy, lust, that all has to do with the natural. It all has to do with earthly. It all has to do with the opposite of the royal law. Royal law is love others as you love yourself. The opposite of that is love yourself who cares about others. I mean, there's better, there's other ways of putting it, but this is love self. Don't care about others. Get it your way not god's way the opposite of reliance i like that word the trust i like that word the reliance on god and knowing that he is the source of all things all good things right okay now when we get to verse four the first two words what is that word? That What's that second word in verse four? Adulteress. Adulteresses. Right. Okay. What 
is an adulterer? Somebody being being okay, two of you are talking at the same time. I don't mind that, but somebody speak. I know Dorothy was talking. Somebody else was talking. I think Millie. Yeah, sexual adultery. Yes, there's sexual adultery. And that, by definition, is sex outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. Right? Extramarital affair. Yes. extra. We, we use terms like extramarital affair. Those are other terms. Okay, Millie, were you going to say something? Um, yeah, but to me, not just sexual. It could be like emotional adultery. Just giving your... Um, giving what belongs to your spouse to somebody else. That's a good way of putting it. That, that's, a, that's a broader um, context in terms. Of, and we all know uh, whether we've ever experienced it or seen it through someone else um, or seen it in a movie or something else, that emotional, that emotional relationship, it always leads to, I mean, it, it can't, no, I shouldn't say that, doesn't always culminate in the sexual part, like where they literally are having sex with each other, but they're still, it's almost more dangerous. Like more people break up marriages through the, uh, that emotional connection than necessarily the physical that might come later. Um, so it is, it, and, and that's why Jesus said what he said and that I mentioned earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, where he was like, it starts in your brain, mm -hmm. right? It starts there. And, and we saw this week through, and we've seen in other weeks, many times through these cross references Jesus says, it's not what you put in your mouth and consume that goes into your stomach and, and sorry to say it, but it is expelled from your body through your entire digestive tract. It leaves and exits your body. That's not what defiles you. It's what you take into your brain and your heart. That, and because guess what happens? It comes out of your mouth. And that goes back to what James said about the tongue, right? But it comes out in other ways. It can come out in physical activity, like having sex with somebody that is not your spouse. Mm -hmm. okay. And this, the debate that we have in this country right now is it's it it's so simple to bring it all the way back down to one definition. The only time sex is okay is when one man and one ma woman are married. Period. Period. Anything else is. Okay is under the category of fornication or sexual immorality or adultery. And technically speaking, uh, let's just say adultery is committed by married people. Fornication is committed by non-married people, but they're all under the umbrella of sexual immorality. And so the easiest way to define, to define sexual immorality is defining what it is not. The only non-sexual immorality is a man and a woman that are married having sex. That's the only time it's not sexual immorality. And I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how, you know, in love they are. I don't care how God wants them to be happy, which by the way, that's a justification. I don't care yeah. what they say. It comes down to, and so I will, I have <laughs> said to people, I can, I can feel badly for their circumstances. I can feel for them. And when it's really hard sometimes to deal with these issues, when you're dealing with real people, it's a lot easier when you're dealing with a concept, right? And you're not talking names. I, I don't care. I mean, I do care, but I'm saying from the standpoint of being right and true with God's word, that's the only definition that's right. Everything else is against God's ways. It is sexual immorality. And an ongoing practice of that puts you on the list of people who do not inherit the kingdom of God. I didn't make those rules up just speaking the truth from the word. So when you get into um, this adulterous word, where there is that definition. Okay, is he talking here necessarily and completely and only about people who are married that are having sex outside of marriage? 
Is that who he's addressing here when he says you adulteresses? What's another way God uses this word? Just think it's because they were attracted who's... to idolatry. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. adultery. And, uh, yes, uh, yes, you're right. And Sandy, what were you saying? No, I was just thinking that it's just you're not doing what God wants you to do. You're breaking the laws. Okay. All right. So, so you're an adult. You're adulterous to everything. Okay. That's bad. Right. <laughs> Idolatry is definitely like in the scripture to adultery, spiritual adultery, right? And Sandy is saying anything against God. Now, I agree with you. I'm asking now, what is the basis of our relationship with God that could make us a spiritual adulterer? What are we called? The church is called what? You looked it up this week too. A bride. The bride. The bride. Mm, right. Of Christ, right? We're married. Spiritually, we're married. So when we break the marriage vows, which isn't always a sexual thing in this case of spiritual adultery. So you're both right. Idolatry would fall under that. And, and really idolatry isn't necessarily having that idol, that thing that you're bowing down to in your house, because rarely are you going to find, there are some people that do that, but they're not usually found going to church. Um, but we do have, I, ourselves can be the idol. Our children, Friendship with the world. Friendship with the world. There you go. And that's where we are in verse four, <laughs> when you go right on. Adulteresses, it says, you, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Um, so here we're adulteresses because we're the bride. We're the bride of Christ. Um, by the way, in the Old Testament, Israel was married to the father. So in the New Testament, the bride is composed of Jews and Gentiles that have come to believing in Jesus Christ and salvation. Okay. So it can be Jews and Gentiles, but God's God showed himself. Well, if you look at the book of, I think it's Hosea, he divorces his bride. He divorces his wife. So, and then that you see that in their captivity, you see that, but the whole point is restoration later. But um, so the picture has been there, old Testament and new Testament of this marriage to God um, our marriage to our, as the church, we're the bride of Christ that's shown throughout scripture. You saw that this week in, uh, looking up the passages that Paul writes about, um, the, um, shoot, um, how the husband is supposed to love the wife as Christ loved the church, how the wife is supposed to submit to the husband, how the husband is the head of the household, how God is, Christ is the head of the husband. All of that talk, all of that language that is usually used to keep us women in place is really there to show us our, our position, our protection. I mean, okay, yes, we are to submit to our husbands because they're the head. They have the responsibility that God has given them as a head of our household, whether they're doing it or not. That's the responsibility they will face before God, okay? As the su subjecting to him, guess what he's supposed to do towards us? Let's, let's not tell him his responsibility, but let's look at his responsibility. And that is to love us as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? What did he ultimately do? He sacrificed. died for the church. Yeah, sacrificially. So kind of the tongue in cheek kind of, kind of question is, I don't doubt that most husbands would die for their wives, but will they live for their wives? Mm -hmm. Live a sacrificial life, right? Okay, but also scripture tells us we're to subject ourselves to each other. So even us, are, we're sub, to be subject to each other. It's the idea of selflessly living, you know, just not, Philippians tells us that we are not to view ourselves higher than anyone else. This, this concept over history of the church has not been held very well. But when you do look at that, it's not just directions and guidance. It's really good practical stuff for how we are to live out our lives. But it also shows us that picture. 
that picture of how God views us, the church, as his bride. I mean, marriages aren't always a whole lot of fun, but when you're getting ready for that wedding, you know, or you're helping somebody else get ready, ready for that wedding and you're around that just love, 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 you know, it's just amazing, right? And that's the view. It, it's, it's a poor view, but it's still a picture that we can see of our relationship with God and how he views us. He views us as his bride. He views us as that beautiful person walking down the aisle in that beautiful white spotless dress. That's the picture, right? White linen, fine linen is re uh, revelation tells us the fine linen that revelation tells us that was given to the bride is likened to what? The righteous acts of the saints. So there's that God, God sovereignty and man responsibility portion always, you know, goes back to the works works that are going to be a result of our salvation, not a works to salvation or a works to keep salvation, but a works that are a result of a salvation. Um, and those righteous acts clothe us in that fine linen. That's how God views us. God views us with Christ's righteousness. Because remember when in Revelation it says that, that was given to her. That was Christ's righteousness given to his bride. In America, we get marriages the provision of marriage completely wrong it's always on the bride and all this other stuff and really it was always more so the responsibility on the groom and the father of the groom um but still we can see some of it but it says he calls them adulteresses and he likens that to friendship with the world we did a lot of look this week friendship with the world when you look this up this week, um, it also says friendship to the world is hostility toward God. And it also means that you are an enemy. Enemy of God. God. Enemy to God. Um, well, mine says of, but yeah, the, it just depends on the preposition. But friendship with the world is hostility towards God, and that makes you an enemy of God. Is that what you want said of yourself? Again, when you're given those those absolute choices right in front of you, okay, I'm going to call you an enemy of God forever. I'm going to say you're hostile towards God, or I want to call you a friend of God. I want to say there is no hostility towards God. Which are you going to choose? This one, <laughs> most I think everybody on here would. There's probably some people in the world that are like, I don't care. I, I'll be hostile towards God. And, you know, that's not going to work out well for them. But here's the thing. Prior to salvation, what were we all like? We looked at disobedient. disobedient. Yes. We looked at some verses this week, but some of this you could just know and answer. We're, we were disobedient all the time. We were in that category. Hostile towards God, enemy of God. We were slaves to deceiver. We were slaves, yes, to the deceiver. We were slaves to unrighteousness, right? Mm -hmm. Sin, it's another way, we were slaves of sin. We were under the law. I'm sorry, you said something about the law. What did you say? Under the law? Yes, we were, un well, some were, some were at least trying. Yeah. Um in a way, we all were because we were without excuse. But yeah, some were actually trying to follow the law um, and failing because we all do. We all fail to try to follow the law. Um, but there was also the under the law in the sense of um, falling under the consequences of the law. Like we're held to the standard of the law and we're, we're, we're not, it's not going to work out well for us. All of those are true of us. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. It's another um, we were all doing those things. We were slaves to unrighteousness. We were always sinning. We were disobedient all the time. And what did Christ do? Not just salvation, not just death, but it talks about bring, it's called reconciliation. He made us alive. 
Yes. He made us alive. Yes. that And that's certainly important because we were dead before and made us alive so that we can live and we can walk. We can walk in his life. Right. But he broke down this wall. He broke down this wall that stood between us true. and God and he brought us near. Right. And the beauty of this is as Gentiles, Philippians says he we were afar we are far away and he brought us near as well the Jews knew that they were near they weren't mm -hmm. quite there but they were near but he brought us and then he also broke down the wall between Jew and Gentile and reconciled us into one body into one building there's all these word pictures all these analogies but it's the bringing us near the reconciling us to God he set and us free he set us free Set us free from that slavery to sin, that slavery to disobedience, that slavery to that old master. He translated us. He picked us up out of the kingdom of darkness and put us into the kingdom of light. Notice it's he did. He did. He did. He did all of it. He did. And he tore the, and he tore the veil. That tore the veil, that. which was representing his flesh, right? But he tore the veil. And what does that gain us access to? forgiveness access to god yes it get, well forgiveness yes but he gained it gained us it's the picture of access unfettered access to the throne of grace for help in time of need which we didn't have before that veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies and his flesh being the veil was torn and now we have un, through his flesh we have access to god you didn't even look up that stuff this week. Isn't that awesome truth? Isn't that awesome truth? But we used to be hostile to God. We used to be enemies of God. That's how everyone is born. And now we're not anymore. But here it says, that's the reason we're called adulteresses. If we're, if we're in this category, if we have a friendship with the world, the, yeah. friendship with the world is this earthly wisdom. It's natural. It's demonic. It includes jealousy, selfish ambition, arrogance, lying against the truth, and results in disorder and evil. And then you go back to verse one. What are the sources of the quarrels and conflicts among you? Now, who are the among you here? Is this in the world? I mean, I'd say yes, it's, it's true of the world because the world is under the system. But he's talking to Christians. Christian community. Christian community. Yes. Uh, yes, he's talking to in individuals, but by and large, he's talking among you. And remember when he says that wage war in your members, that can be talking about an individual and our individual body parts, because he talks about that, the members of our physical bodies and how we're supposed to keep those under control. But here he's talking about the community. He's talking about the members, okay? So put yourself in, put this all in the context of your local church, the church you go to. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts in any given church? What we're talking about here. It goes all the way down to, he brings it down to like, you do this, you do that, you're envious, you're jealous, you're uh, ambitious, and you're lying to yourself, and you've got that earthly wisdom or the wisdom not from above, all of that tied in. And then it comes down to you're trying to, you're trying to get things your way rather than relying and trusting on God by asking him. That's a huge contrast there. Relying on yourself versus relying on God. And the bottom line is, what are your motives? Mm -hmm. What is driving you? Are you tapping into the wisdom from above? Okay, the dualism that we have within ourselves in this sanctification process is we are living in these earth suits, these bodies. And we're always going to have this battle that Paul describes wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Mm -hmm. Answer is Jesus. But, but we, we have that dual nature in a sense where yet we're supposed to live like the old man is dead. 
we'd be so much better off if we just leave him dead, mm-hmm. leave him buried and not being a friend with the world. Second John is a great, we just did second John not long ago. So this is a very familiar passage, but second John, I think it's two. No, it's second, first John, sorry, first John two, not second John, first John two, where he says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Do you see all of that here? The mm-hmm. lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life um, is not from the Father. It's demonic. It's natural. It's earthly. Okay. But is from the world. I said it. And, sorry. The world is passing away and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God never dies. Never dies. Yes. Again, given the choice, um, wouldn't you wouldn't you love if you were just talking to any person and you said, okay, I'm going to give you a choice, heaven or hell. And then you describe heaven as best you can and you describe hell the best you can. There's not one person that would actually choose hell. Okay. Thing is, salvation isn't a choice. We we have a tendency to present it as such, but salvation isn't a choice. Salvation is a call and, and a response, right? It's all provided for by God. We receive it. We believe. We have faith. That's all we do. Um, but if given a choice, like remember the, uh, what was that show? Um, with the curtains, one, two, and three, or, you know, you'd always, what's behind curtain number one? What's kind of, what does that show? Anyway, if we were always given choices like that, and we knew what was behind the curtain, we'd always choose. We choose with selfish motives, (laughs) but we would, we would choose what would be best for us. But salvation is about God revealing it to us. And giving obedience. Salvation is obedience. It is an act of obedience to Mm -hmm. the truth that he has revealed to us. And then it's a living in obedience afterwards. Um, Absolutely. But can we, and this is the million dollar question, can we as Christians who are living in this world Mm -hmm. on the surface of this planet, can we be in friendship with the world as you looked things up this week like i just read first john um and all the other passages you read this week can we live our christian life and i I talked about dualism i'm just talking about the battle between us i'm not saying we can give ourselves an excuse can well i guess i'll just answer my question can we have friendship with the world no i guess the answer is yes we can should we (laughs) no we can't and be spirit-led it's on those moments moment by moment that we get off the throne of our hearts and let the spirit guide when you process it's a continuous process Always. Just we have to wear the armor of God each day. That will help us to. That's an actually going. wonderful activity is mm-hmm. to think through Ephesians chapter six and six. on those armor. And, and, and sometimes I'll do that. I, you know, I, I sometimes will go through a process of prayer where I, I'm like doing the motions even, you know, <laughs> hurting my belt and it, and it's really just going through those scriptures um i also do essential oils and sometimes i'll add in essential oils while i'm doing it and this this just go through the practice of praying that through and just it's a great way to start your day not that not that i can bring something about as much as my mind is focused on the right thing and i'm submitting myself to god when i do that and re- relying on him 
Mm -hmm. It's got to be him and me. So you looked up a lot about the world. You looked up a lot about even the word friendship. It's just the word phileo or philia. I think it was. Um, the world wasn't anything real profound. It was just cosmos, which is setting things in order, which is the opposite of disorder, right? Um, it's it's the idea of um, space, but not time. So it can include all of the universe. It's the sum total of the material universe and the beauty that's in it. Sum total of a person living in the world. That's the word cosmos. So that in and of itself doesn't necessarily help us know what does it mean to be a friend to the world until you look at the behaviors, when you look at the cautions, when you look at the what we were versus what we are, that's where you get that understanding of, I'm trying to stay closer to the time. I know a lot of people, I can be this person, but I mean, I know a lot of people who go to church, have a really good life, don't seem to have problems and seem to be living, you know, like claim to be Christians. And yet when you look at their extra activities, they don't align with what, and that, that is sometimes I have to be cautious and am I putting my rules on their life, my choices on their life. And I've got to work, you know, be careful of that. But when it's more extreme and more overt and understandable, you cannot claim to be a Christian and be living a Christian life and be in, in adultery or be, and I'm talking about the physical interpersonal relationship adultery, not the spiritual adultery, because that's its own thing. You, you cannot be sexually promiscuous you cannot be heterosexual or homosexual in activity. Notice I'm talking about a difference because if you are celibate and you have desires, that is not sin. That's how God made us. When you act on those desires in a non-okay way, that's the sin. Now, Jesus says in your mind and all that, so I'm not taking that part away. I'm just making a distinction between however you feel, however, whatever you think about homosexuality, let's just say. Um, if there is a person who has those desires and does not act on them, self-control, they can be a Christian. And I, I, you're here in my, my viewpoint, Okay. It's the acting on it that would be wrong because it it's in the same category as heterosexual immorality. Heterosexual immorality would be an unmarried person who has desires, not wrong. If they act on those desires, they're wrong. Okay. We as Christians, a lot of times like to point to that other group and not point to the group that's more like us. Heterosexual immorality and homosexual immorality are both wrong. So I'm not excusing one over the other. I'm not. I'm saying they're both equally wrong. But in the church, a lot of times we point to that other group and say, we point to them because they're not like us. But we allow in our churches, in our pews, and with our friends and family heterosexual immorality because it's natural we're not right to do that we're to call that out as well in a loving way pointing it out to them so i anytime a discussion comes up about homosexuality i always throw heterosexuality in there too i do it every time it actually shuts down most arguments because they're assuming as a christian i'm going to be opposed to it and i am but I'm also opposed to heterosexual immorality as equally. I literally, and I have my own fleshly response to it, but as equally, I am opposed to it. So, um, and that's just one area of sin in our world. Um, it can be, well, we're not going to go into all of them, but 
again, drinking is not wrong. Drunkenness is wrong. Drunkenness is wrong. Um, pornography is a form of adultery because you're lusting after someone and looking on something you're not supposed to be looking on. You're looking on somebody else's that's not your spouse. Um, we could go on, but can you be what we're calling here, what he's calling here, a friend of the world? When God says it's hostility towards God and it's an enemy of God, I think the answer is very obvious as Christians know. But then we have to back up and say, what does it mean to be a friend with the world? And we looked up a lot of verses this week. Romans 8, 5 to 9 and 14 talk about those who walk according to the flesh versus those who walk according to the spirit. So if I were going to, to give you those two choices, walking according to the flesh and walking according to the spirit, which one of them applies to friendship with the world? Walking in flesh. Yes. And it's hostile to God. So that's a good clue there, right? Um and the second Corinthians talks about jealousy and, uh, but it's talking about Paul saying, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, but because he betrothed them or us to one husband, that is Christ. Um, I remember we studied second Corinthians one time with a group and there were people that had a real problem with this word jealous. Do y'all have a problem with God being jealous or Paul being jealous on God's behalf? No, now the way we use the word jealous, like here, mm -hmm. it, it's not good, but there is a godly jealousy. There is God's jealousy and there is us a godly jealousy. Like we want to protect and preserve someone um, away from the things that would cause those issues. Um, okay. So we're going to stop. Um, but does anybody... Did anybody not understand or have any questions about like even specifics on what does it mean to be in this world and not of this world or be in this world and be a friend of the world? Or was it clear? Okay, I think in a broad sense, like we said before, I think we get this, but then it comes down to the moment by moment, decision by decision, day by day. And I, that's where I go back to, that's what it means to walk in faith. Because if it was all settled and we never had another issue, would we ever have to exercise faith? Hmm. No. And and this world, this this world we live in is hard. But this life we live in this world is, it can be hard. It can come at us, but it can also from within us be really hard. Like, you know, I love sugar. I'd love to eat it all the time. It is not good for me. And my body tells me all the time, it's not good for me. Um, and it's a struggle, but it is a struggle that I can give over to God. And it's going to be a moment by moment thing. It's not going to be me sitting here right now and saying, Lord, take my desire for sugar away. You might do that. You probably know people who tell a story of salvation that includes their drug addiction going away just like that. And then there's other people that struggle for uh, the rest of their lives. We've got the story of Paul. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh is, but he had a thorn in the flesh and he asked three times for God to remove it. What was God's response? My grace is sufficient for you. And where is the power? In faith. In faith. It's in his weakness. His it's in walking yeah. in faith. But it's it's the power. Number one is recognizing you're weak. And in that weakness, knowing through that weakness, God can show his power. Um, so sometimes the whatever the addiction, if you want to call it, whether it's drugs or sugar, whatever addiction you have, um, sometimes God leaves it because then you have to rely, we're back to that word, you have to rely on him for that spirit guided moment by moment, walking through life on your knees in prayer. 
a flock. Okay, so if you have if you have any questions, now is a good time to ask um, about like if you if if this was unclear, not just from me, but from your week of what it, what is God looking at? Don't forget, He calls them adulteresses. I didn't want that word to not be pointed out because friendship with the world in our marriage relationship to Christ is adultery. Mm. That's how God views it. And there's not one person here that would not understand how human relationship adultery would affect you. And then now you take that to your relationship with God. Does he take it casually? Is he not impacted? I mean, God has emotions. He will, he will be, you know, we, we can't hurt him in the sense of like damaging him, but our relationship will be impacted if we are adulterers, spiritual adulterers. And that comes about through this friendship with the world. And usually that comes about because we care about ourselves and we care about the opinion of others. Opinion of others is still caring about ourselves, care about what they think about me more so than in that moment, thinking about what God thinks about me. So I liked what Millie was saying earlier. I had so many times this week, I was thinking about quarrels and conflicts and going, I need to read verse, the, the first few verses of James 4. But there really was a big situation um, out. It was among a group, not me in particular. And I'm just watching this and I'm going, what is the source of the quarrels and conflicts among you? And it comes right down to this wisdom from the earth, not from above, this selfish ambitions, this these lusts that we have. I mean, the lust that leads to murder, that might be literal murder. But it's certainly hatred. I mean, I think we mentioned that earlier. It's hatred of a person because uh, we want what they have. And envy, um, covetous, covetousness is um, is idolatry, is what Paul calls it. So when we covet what somebody else has, and it can be their position, it can be their looks, it can be their gender, it can be whatever, um, then we are... We're, we're, it's a form of idolatry. And really the biggest idol in our lives is ourselves. So, um, okay, we're going to finish. I'm going to pray and then we'll come back for the video. Um, just these four verses next week, we'll finish chapter four. We could have looked at more, but we will look at it the rest of next week, if Lord willing, and we come back next week uh, on, you know, as regularly scheduled. Um, and we've only got eight, nine, 10, eight, nine, and 10. I think there's only 10. Yeah, eight, nine, and 10. We've only got three more weeks. Good stuff. All right. Father in heaven, um, we just ask that you will somehow help us moment by moment to understand exactly the impact all of this has, to help us just see our own motives and our own heart. Um, even when we really think we are doing your will and doing what you would want us to do, even in our prayers, reveal to us any source. It can be ultimately we're doing the right thing, but there can still be some root within there that we need to just pull out and with your help and your direction and your spirit guiding. But other than that, Father, also just moment by moment walking, somehow discerning constantly between what is of this world and what is of from above and, and showing us that wisdom. Sometimes it's clear if it's causing disorder and it's evil and it's not peaceable and not of your fruit and not um, gentle and not reasonable and not full of mercy, sometimes it's really obvious. And other times it's not when it might be a difficult situation that we're having to be part of or dealing with. And at the moment, it doesn't feel peaceful. It doesn't even feel gentle. But if our motives are right, and if it really is from you, and if ultimately that person's good is in mind, then again, keeping our selfish ambition out of it um, with your guidance and your word will. It's tough, Father. And you've, you've left us in this, this world to refine us, to grow us, to cause us to become stronger. 
and these situation come these situations come and sometimes all we want to do is run and hide and let somebody else deal with them when you've put them right in our laps for us to deal with grow us up and let us put on your full armor and walk in this world but not like the world we ask for all of that which is a huge ask for discernment and all of that but just knowing that we need to trust you rely on you believe that you have our best interests at heart and even when we don't want it we might need it and we ask for all of this in jesus name amen amen